Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Hyperledger Global Forum 2021. Uh, boy, what a year it has been. <laughs> uh, uh, we have three really exciting days of content lined up for you. Uh, oh, I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm executive director of Hyperledger. I, I, we have a, an amazing crew that's helped put this together, an amazing set of speakers lined up for you. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors uh, with a special thank you to our Diamond sponsors, Accenture and IBM, as well as to our Platinum sponsors, the Falcoin Foundation, Hitachi, Siemens, and Zulig Pharmaceutical. Um, I'd also uh, like to make a quick reminder about our event code of conduct. While we are virtual, everyone will have numerous opportunities to collaborate and engage with other attendees throughout the event. Please ensure that you have read and abide by our code of conduct, which in short states that all attendees should feel safe, should feel welcome, and should feel included at the event. If anyone has any issues or witnesses anything during the event that violates our code of conduct, please message our event staff right away. Uh, we have an amazing set of uh, 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 content lined up for us and, and opportunities to get to meet the community, to really dive in and understand. But I wanted to set a bit of context first uh, for the period of time since the last time we were able to get together, uh, if we can bring up the deck. Um, I, so if anyone remembers uh, and or was there with us in Phoenix, Arizona, in March of 2020, uh, March 4th, 5th, and 6th to be exact, because I, re I remember that because I remember flying home that night. I think I even said to a friend, um, I think I'm going to go home and basically not leave the house for a year. I had an intuition that something was going to be strange. Maybe it was the fact that we had our evening event at the Corona Ranch, which is what this is a photo of. Um, but I don't think any of us could have predicted the next 12 months, the next 15 months, really, uh, since, uh, since we last met. Uh, it's been been a, a tumultuous time and you know what we'd forged there at the at the last hyperledger global forum and obviously what we forged over the last five years here at hyperledger has been uh, a really strong community that lasted even as things got kind of dark even when we had to shift from the face-to-face -face events not just events like global forum but all of our meetups all of the diff different uh, other open source events or other blockchain conferences or the like, or even just, you know, the way that we used to engage with our coworkers and with our customers and, uh, you know, getting together for coffee or, or uh, hacking at a hackathon or something like that. All of that, that got really hard really quickly. And we started to realize the depth of the challenge that we were in, I think. Uh, I, and you know, the, the the open source community started to respond, the, the Hyperledger community responded. I think people in the enterprise blockchain industry realized that this was a moment that, that called for us to think creatively about how we might apply these technologies. There's a bunch of examples, and you'll hear about some of them over the next few days, where the, the Hyperledger community did respond to this call, call out for uh, creative solutions to things like supply chain uh, traceability at a time when and PPEs were hard to procure, and there were a lot of new companies offering face masks and, and protective equipment without any histories. Uh, well, it was really cool to have a, a source called Trust Your Supplier to be able to track the provenance of where these goods are being created. When there was a, a lot of concern about how data was being shared uh, between organizations, uh, it was really good to have uh, the use of some of the blockchain uh, systems out there uh, to be able to, to look up data sets uh, and, and, and respond to them. Uh, we also have started to see digital identity tools uh, uh, that come from Hyperledger used in answering questions about, uh, I, I, you know, can we prove the status of somebody's vaccination status? Can we prove uh, the, the integrity of somebody's test result? Uh, and you uh, it, it have an interoperable system for uh, showing these kinds of proofs of status uh, uh, internationally using self-sovereign identity pioneered by the Hyperledger, Indy, and Aries communities. Um, we started to see these solutions emerge. And, uh, and that, that, I think, allowed us to be part of what has actually been a reopening of society in some ways, but also a reopening of um, the IT industry. And kind of, I, I, I think we're all at a much better spot than many of us thought we would be back in May or June 2020. Um, and in fact, uh, towards the end of 2020, it looked quite a bit like the enterprise blockchain sector uh, was going uh, was was going to be just fine. Uh, at the end of 2020, PwC released a report where they said block enterprise blockchain technology was still on track to deliver, in their estimate, uh, more, almost two trillion dollars of value to the global economy by 2030. And they said most businesses 
will be using blockchain technology by 2025. Right at a time when it might have felt like blockchain winter out there, uh, it was really good to have some reassurance based on their anal analysis, based on surveys of industry leaders, of companies in this space, uh, that uh, uh, all of that was was still moving forward in a really big way. Um, and they weren't alone. Deloitte also did a survey, an update of a survey it's done over the last three years, uh, uh, since 2018, 2019, and then in 2020, asking uh, you know, executives, do you still plan to adopt blockchain technology? Is it a strategic priority? Uh, uh, is it integral to how uh, you think about innovation? And they found that, you know, just as 2019 improved upon 2018, 2020 improved upon 2019, and the confidence of C-suites that they were going to be adopting these technologies, that they were looking at these technologies, they felt it played a major role, uh, that it was in their top five strategy. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and most of them could see through the hype. Most of them, uh, you know, while conceding that hype, even in 2020, was higher than it might have been in other places, uh, uh, they also said there is something real here and something we need to be paying attention to. And I really think that's uh, in due large part to the the proof points that we've accomplished uh, here at the Hyperledger uh, through through Hyperledger through the, the 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 community we've built here. And I wanted to walk through some of these areas because uh, Price uh, Waterhouse Coopers in their report identified three main areas, which are the same areas that I think we've talked about a lot as some of the first real proving grounds for this technology. The first of those are in uh, uh, payments and financial instruments, in digital assets, in the use of these technologies for settlement, for, for all sorts of use cases that have to do with moving money around the world at the blink of an eye. Um, uh, one of the, the headlines on that has been the Bank of Cambodia's Project Bakong. Uh, we'll hear much more about that very soon in the, uh, another part of this uh, uh, keynote here, uh, which is uh, uh, was recognized by PwC as the second global uh, retail central bank digital currency deployed uh, ever. Um, we actually did a case study on that. Uh, also, the Bank of Thailand launched a, uh, a project called uh, Inthanon Lion Rock, um, uh, which is based on Hyperledger Bezu for its pilot CBDC. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank launched a CBDC pilot called Dcash on top of Hyperledger Fabric. But it wasn't limited to CBDCs, and we're going to hear a lot more about that. That is a, a real headline uh, kind of use of these technologies. Um, but it, but also for bond markets uh, has been another example for trade finance. Uh, in fact, in bond markets, uh, blockchain technology partners uh, had led an implementation for the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange of um, a, a trading network for uh, contracts and for uh, all sorts of financial instruments uh, on, uh, through the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Uh, and then Bond E-Value, which is a bond exchange that, that both of which we've also written about and provided webinars and case studies on. Um, and this, is, th this technology is becoming normalized. This is becoming something that if you're building financial infrastructure, especially if it's crossing a border somewhere, you're likely thinking about how to use distributed ledger at the heart of that new kind of technology. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to advance the slide there. Um, uh, another key area where we're seeing it used is in the application of provenance, uh, 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 in supply chain traceability, in ensuring the safety and, and uh, 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 of, of supply chains, ensuring that fraud uh, is uh, countered, you know, you know, people can't put fraudulent product into supply chains. Uh, this is now perhaps more commonly known by the term NFT, where uh, uh, the whole NFT world is really about provenance. It's really about where did this uh, either digital or physical product come from? From and uh, uh, who was involved in creating it? What was the path that it took to get to me? Uh, but provenance has been something we've been in this space, uh, that Hyperledger has been in this space for a long time, uh, whether it's the WeTrade, trade finance uh, uh, and, and, and supply chain uh, project, whether it's the Walmart system uh, that uh, uh, for uh, traceable food, uh, uh, sorry, food trust and traceable food supplies uh, and, and many of the networks they've set up actually, uh, whether it's Ledger Domain who have implemented a system for traceability in the pharmaceutical Pharmaceutical sector. Um, the, this is this is core, so core to, to how we build society. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, if, if anything today, this this resurgence, the economic recovery, is straining global supply chains. And having tools like distributed ledger as a way to rationalize them, to understand where products are, uh, where they're flowing, and 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 where they came from, is becoming even more important. 
Um, uh, the third use case and one that we've long talked about and is obviously core to, 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 to the, the product portfolio at Hyperledger is digital identity. Uh, you've seen case studies from uh, Hyperledger focusing on its use for uh, uh, something called Member Pass from, from Bonifi, which is a digital identity ecosystem for credit unions and their members. Um, Secure Keys uh, launched a platform called Verified.me on top of Hyperledger Fabric, which is also in the self-sovereign identity space. Of course, our friends uh, at, in British Columbia, continue to have successes as they grow the the uh, the org book, which is the self sovereign identity system uh, for business owners and for businesses uh, out of there. Um, this is a sector that's growing very quickly. The technology is being adopted and rationalized very quickly. Uh, and what's cool is uh, that it's proving itself out, and and we're going to see its application very soon in the field of. Uh, vaccination status and and being able to reopen uh, uh, businesses that are that are very health sensitive. Uh, uh, there's some big movements there, and you'll hear a lot about this uh, during the keynotes uh, this week. Um, uh, all of these really feed up to what is a landscape of uh, uh, different users out there, different organizations that is best mapped by the Forbes Blockchain 50, uh, which is a survey now in its third year, I believe, uh, that looks over uh, the, the 50 largest companies out there uh, using enterprise blockchain technology and covering a few that are dabbling here in Bitcoin and the like, but the vast majority of those, uh, over 60%, 60 I believe, uh, so 30 out of those 50, use a Hyperledger technology somewhere in their infrastructure. Uh, some of them obviously very deep at their core, uh, and uh, it really helps establish the community of different uh, platforms that we've built here as the reference point in this industry. So something we're incredibly proud of. Um, so here at Hyperledger Global Forum, as you know, we are splitting ourselves into two, two different segments uh, to make sure that we're truly covering the globe as, as uh, conveniently as we can to really speak to a global audience, but also hear from a global audience. So we have this segment, segment one, taking place uh, at hours that we hope are appropriate and, and uh, convenient for people in Asia Pacific and early in Europe. There'll be a segment two starting at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and across all of these segments, we have over 100 hours of panels, demos, and other sessions. We have six sessions that are in Chinese. Uh, so thank you to the Chinese community for submitting those talks. Uh, we have over 214 talks that were submitted. So, so an incredible amount of content across our, our community. Um, uh, uh, we also have uh, a pretty interesting diversity when it comes to speakers and attendees. More than half uh, are come from outside of North America uh, of both speakers and attendees. About 20% uh, of both speakers and attendees are female, which is not high enough, uh, uh, but is is better than uh, par for the blockchain industry uh, and, and we will continue to do better. But uh, I, I think that's a number to be actually pretty happy about. And, and, and there's some really compelling talks uh, mixed in there. Um, and uh, of our speakers, uh, uh, about 21% of them are from non, are non-white in, in, in ethnicity. And I think that's super important as well to make sure that we're really representing a global audience. And sincere thanks to the program committee. I'll be telling you more about them tomorrow. Uh, I, and uh, I'm sorry, on, on the third day, I, uh, and who they are and how they made their uh, decisions as, as we uh, made our way through this. Um, you'll hear uh, uh, presentations from uh, uh, lots of different organizations here, major organizations, large organizations, both on the keynote stage, as well as uh, uh, making presentations. Uh, but it's also the startups in this space that really give it the vitality, that give it the creativity and the innovation um, and, and carry a, a tremendous amount of the, the implementation work on their shoulders. Um, uh, and so it's uh, the community is really a hybrid of large and small, of um, you know, old world and new world, a uh, global community. We're really happy. Let me give you just a preview of the keynotes coming up. We're about to, to hear after, after Arnaud speaks from uh, I, I, uh, to have a keynote panel on central bank digital currencies uh, uh, with Saray Che from the National Bank of Cambodia, uh, as well as Sopnendu Mohanty from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Just after me, you'll hear from Arnaud Lehor, uh, who is the uh, uh, Technical Steering Committee Chair, uh, as well as a Senior Technical Staff Member uh, at IBM. Uh, and then uh, in segment two, we'll be repeating a little bit of this content. Arno will also be speaking in segment two um, to make sure that we really cover the globe with uh, the update on, on what's going on in the Hyperledger technical community, which is a key part of why we're here and why this conference is here. Um, but we'll also be hearing in segment two for, uh, the 
perspective of a major regulator in the United States, uh, uh, Frank Giannis, who is the Deputy Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Food Policy and Response for the FDA. He has been a pioneer in the use of blockchain technology for supply chains uh, in, in the food sector. And so I'm ecstatic to have him here. And I hope all of you are able to stay up late or get up early, whatever time zone you're in, and able to follow those, uh, the, those keynotes in segment two. We also have entirely different sessions uh, between session and one and two. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to join and attend us there. Um, just a few other reminders before we move on. Um, uh, there is a virtual hallway track this year in a fun little uh, community tool called Gather Town. Uh, we have a link to it in Hopin. Feel free to join it. Think of this as the virtual hallway track, you know, the place you can drop in, wander around, find people you want to talk with, uh, uh, lean in, listen in on their conversation. It's a really fun tool. I'll be there as much as I can uh, and invite all the speakers and other attendees to come by uh, in between sessions or if you find yourself with free time. Uh, I, uh, it'd be it's, a, it's something we hope people really try. There's another networking tool available in Hopin, uh, just simply called networking, which is uh, something we hope you use during the breaks. And it's a chance to meet uh, randomly with another uh, person from the Hyperledger community, another attendee here at Hyperledger Global Forum. Uh, and so please take advantage of that. Uh, it's as close as we can get to two people waiting in line at the buffet uh, at a physical event and getting to know each other even when they didn't have any reason to start talking. Um, uh, be sure and claim your Kiva credit. Uh, Kiva is a partner this year. They are making available to everybody a uh, $25 uh, credit uh, uh, at Kiva. Um, that is capacity limited, so be sure and claim it before those run out. Uh, but that is uh, uh, Kiva, as you know, is building has built a uh, self-sovereign identity system for the government of Sierra Leone using Hyperledger technology, something they call the Kiva protocol. So we're really happy to have them again as a partner here. And 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 look. It's free money, go for it. Um, on Wednesday, before segment two, uh, there's a boff from something called the Crypto Open Patent Alliance. Uh, this is separate from the rest of the sessions, but it's listed in the calendar. All of you are able to attend. Um, and it's uh, it's an interesting effort to build a patent or a, a kind of conclave around uh, core technologies related to blockchain technology. So uh, uh, as a way to help preserve uh, the openness and uh, of, of the uh, implementations built upon that and any essential patents that might be required. So uh, come to that. Another side event I want to draw your attention to on Friday, there will be a, a, a an event hosted by Kaleido, uh, which is a company that has developed a platform called Firefly that is now in as a blockchain, as a lab under Hyperledger Labs. Uh, really cool technology. They're hosting an entire day of content related to that. So uh, feel free to go and register. We'll be sending some information about this uh, in the email, uh, in a follow-up email as well to all attendees. Links to everything are in Hopin, so please join us there. Um, I know I'm way over my time, but I just want to make one final reminder. Uh, all are welcome in the Hyperledger community. Uh, if you uh, uh, if you ever feel uncomfortable about anything presented, please let us know. Uh, that's the link to the code of conduct. Uh, we are as sincere in wanting to make sure that we can grow this community to be as large as we possibly can and as inclusive of everybody who is a stakeholder and is interested in playing a role in advancing Hyperledger technologies and solving problems with them. So um, with that, I, I, I'd like to pass the mic uh, over to Arno Leors. Uh, Ar Arno is, uh, as I mentioned, the chair of our technical steering committee uh, uh, and is with IBM, but uh, wears his hat as head of the TSC every week on our TSC call, uh, where we talk about the state of the technology under the Hyperledger greenhouse. And so uh, he's here to tell us about what we've seen in the last 15 months in terms of development in the community and the tech Technical community. This is the heart, really, of why we're here. So with that, um, let me transition to Arno.